For this data science chalk talk, let's talk about what every data scientist should know about floating point numbers. Now, in our previous chalk talks, we talked about mathematical numbering systems, such as the natural numbers, and we can decide whether zeros in them or not. That's sometimes optional. The integers, the rational numbers, This notation mean the greatest common divisor of a and b is uh, 1. So the, this is a reduced fraction. These are co-prime. So you would not write 1 half as 2 fourths. And uh, the real numbers, which uh, as we've seen are a fairly large, scary structure. But really, as we teach it in grade school, it's just all the sets of infinite digits going on. So basically a finite number of digits to the left of the decimal point and a possibly infinite number of digits to the right of the decimal point. Now, this is where things get a little weird. These three systems can be represented in computers or on paper. Any number requires only so many digits or so many pages. However, this system cannot be implemented on a computer because Many numbers have an infinite number of non-zero digits to the right of the decimal place, such as one-third, square root of two, or pi. This is a nice rational number. It's inside Q. This is an algebraic number. It's not inside Q. And this is a transcendental number. It's not the solution of any small algebraic equation involving only the integers. So um, these are a very weird and inaccessible set of numbers. Most of them we'll never encounter. There's many more of them, the number of computer programs we can write down, so most of them can't be represented in any way. However, and this is the point of the topic, none of these numbering systems are used normally in a computer. There are several big num implementations that supply these. Um, this is, there's packages that supply these. These are rarely used. This is not used. What is actually used in a computer is called a floating point number. And what I want to convince you in what every data scientist should know about floating point is you're going to miss the rationals. So how is a floating point number implemented? And from that implementation, what are its properties? Well, it's uh, the one that's most common is the double our double precision floating point number. It's represented as 64 bits. A bit is a value that takes on a 0 or a 1. So it represents one piece of information. And a floating point number is the highest bit is the sign. So that's one bit. So that represents whether the number is positive or negative. The next 11 bits are called the exponent. And this has an IEEE um, specification. I think it's IEEE 754, which has several different variations. And the last set of digits is called the fraction. Or not digits, sorry, bits. 52 bits. And this is called the uh, fraction. All floating point numbers are very similar to this. And there are some exceptional cases. When the exponent is um, all zeros, it signals that you're in a special mode. Or if the exponent is uh, all ones, you're also in a special mode. So um, those special no modes are used to represent nan, which is not a number, which has very many representations in floating point, plus and minus infinity, um, just symbols they added into the number system, and also um, denormalized or under small values, which are not very important, so let's skip them. In the normal mode, when the exponent is not one of the special symbols, 
the value of the floating point number is as follows. Negative 1 to the sine times 1 plus some i equals 1 to 52 b 52 minus i, so it's pulling bits out of here, times 2 to the minus i times 2 to the e minus 1, 0, 2, 3. This is e, the exponent. So not the natural log, not the not the natural exponent, but the number here. So again, this is when this exponent is not one of its special symbols of all zeros or all ones. So um, to represent zero, we set the exponent to all zero and we don't get this. So zero is also a special form for floating point. You can have plus and minus zero. It actually still has a sign. So this is how all non-zero floating point numbers are represented. And all it is is we're saying a floating point number has a sign, it's the sum of these small fractions, so it's basically a binary fraction. It's a fraction that only takes on the number, or binary expansion. So this is, this equals one half, this equals one fourth. Just double check that wasn't an invisible color, that in um, binary, this equals one half, this equals one fourth. And so it says, this is just a sum up this is 2 to the negative 1, 2 to the negative 2. This is the number is written as a fraction of 1 point blah, 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 blah. And then this is shifted up or down by the exponent to get larger and smaller numbers. So to write 4, it would be something like um, a plus in the sine column, um, a, a, two, a, a 2 in the exponent, and then all zeros in the fraction, because you get this implicit one right there. So what does that do for the user? Well, the problem here is uh, not all numbers are representable in floating point. For instance, we only have a finite number of binary positions, so we cannot represent the reals. We don't have an arbitrary number of digits or even binary positions. We only have a 52 of them. So we cannot represent all reals. So basically, pi, is off the off the uh, pi is out of the game. Can't represent pi. Square root of two is out of the game, and a third is out of the game, because its representation as digits or binary units doesn't terminate. It's a pattern that repeats over and over again. There's not a lot of information in the digits or binary digits of pi, one third, but uh, it also just can't be represented. Now here's the kicker that makes floating point even worse to deal with than you'd expect. Among the non-representable numbers are our friends one-fifth and one-tenth, which is exactly how we write down decimal digits. So there is no floating point number on your computer that equals 0.2. There is no floating point number on your computer that equals 0.1. The system just picks one very close and prints that very close number as if it were that floating point number. Now, the Bible for floating point is a, a famous paper called What Every Computer Scientist Should Know About Floating Point Arithmetic by David Goldberg in uh, 1991. I think Oracle has a free reprint of that. And that is um, basically the, th the thing to look for. Also, one of the many problems with floating point is since we don't actually um, know any floating point value, um, quite accurately, we um, basically always have to assume you have an error of at least 2 to the minus 53. So even when you type in a number, you may not get that number in the floating point system. You can get 1 half, 1 fourth, things like that, but even 1 third, 1 fifth, and 1 tenth, you cannot get them. So you are off by a relative factor of around this much, this being your mantissa size plus 1, or your fraction size plus 1. Then Whenever you do a floating point calculation, even if the two floating point numbers were representable, the output might not be representable. For instance, we need, may not be able to form 1 divided by 3. This is a representable floating point number. This is representable. The output is not representable. So at each floating point step, we might be accumulating error. That error might be getting bigger or it might not. However, it also means 
we cannot add disparate sized floating point numbers, which I'll give as an example that I attack on. So it turns out the simple act of just summing up a list of numbers might not work on floating point. And also, we don't have the field axioms, which is sort of the whole point of working with numbers, is we want them to obey the field axioms. So we don't have things like x minus y equals 0 if and only if x equals y. So checking if a number is 0 may not do what you want in certain algorithms. So you really, if you're doing numerical analysis, you have to understand that these floating point numbers are in some sense fuzzed or inaccurate. And that inaccuracy can get bigger if you do your calculation in certain ways and can be managed if you do calculations certain other ways, such as variance stabilizing methods like the Kahan summation algorithm, which I'll append to the end of this, or even not using simple formulas like calculating the variance as a difference of two running sums, but instead that turns out to be numerically unstable. And that's what every data scientist needs to know about floating point is it's the most common representation of numbers on your computer and it's weird and inaccurate, cannot represent even one tenth and I think it really makes you miss the real numbers for all their problems because as weird as they are, they're chosen to be essentially the smallest complete ordered completion that contains the rationals. That the rationals seem to be how we might want to represent varying quantities and we run into problems because there's more holes than pieces in the rationals, which I talked about in my other lecture. And the reals, we believe, is one of the cheapest fixes. However, it, as I've also talked about, is a very strange numbering system that cannot be implemented on a computer, even though this one could, though it might be very slow since it has varying size data structures, this one cannot at all. So we go to this very strange floating point system. And the two strangest things about it is it's attempting to represent arbitrary sequences of digits with only fixed length sequences. And instead of doing those in powers of 10 like humans do, it does it in powers of 2, which means some fractions that we're very attached to, such as 1 tenth, are not representable in that system. Every system like this is going to have something not representable, but what's poison is it's something very common, such as um, currency, dollars and cents can't be represented completely accurate. In finance, they actually have systems for dealing with this that are slightly different than floating point because they can't trust floating point with money. Examples of floating point. For this, I'm going to use the uh, data science or statistical platform called R, but we would see very similar results using Python or any other numeric oriented system. So x is 0 if algebra works right because it's 4 fifths subtracted five-fifths off, then put one-fifth back. However, notice when we check is x zero, we get false. And when we print x, we don't get zero. We get 5.5 times 10 to the minus 17. This is called scientific notation. The e here means times 10 to this exponent. So this is a very tiny number, 5.5 times 10 to the minus 17. However, in many printing formats, that would be simplified to just zero. For instance, printf is a common pretty printer. Or if we call format on one-fifth itself, we get it in decimal, the point 0.2. However, if we format it to more digits, we see it only starts as point 0.2. It actually has some garbage down here because the binary representation isn't the same as the decimal. Similarly, we can build a number that's not 1 that prints as 1. And of course, it is not 1. And if we look at more of the decimal digits, we see that it is not 1. Again, the number is not represented as decimal digits, it's represented as binary bits, and that would be why this number of 1 isn't formatting right. Okay, and let's show how the summing doesn't work. We're going to build a very large array of very tiny values, so it's 1 times 10 to the minus 8, repeated 10 to the 8th times, and therefore it sums up to 1. Each one of them is 1 over the length of this array, so this sums up to 1 as we see. Now we build a vector with a very large value concatenated with a, all these values then one very large negative value. Sum it up we get the wrong sum. This should sum to 1. This should cancel this and therefore we should get just this sum which we previously showed sum to 1. However, notice we get a sum of 0. 
This is because just adding up the numbers in order doesn't always work for floating point. Now, we can try a Kahan summing algorithm, and it gets it right. And there's also some more modern algorithms developed by various researchers, which also get it right. And this is from the R package, Precise Sums. I hope that's helpful to you. Maybe that's a little wrap-up of some of my lectures on number systems and to a practical point that you might appreciate as a data scientist. Thank you very much for your time.